82, and has been a class instructor for 20 years. He was a volunteer examiner for FCC licenses for 20 years and published two technical papers, the first in 1996, called A Study of UHF Radio Propagation, Tropospheric Enhancements Covering 17 Months of Observations. This became an invited paper presentation at the UHF Forum in Dayton, Ohio, and mentioned in 1997 with all expenses paid. <laughs> The second book published in 2017 as Effects of the 2017 Total Solar Eclipse on HF Radio Propagation at Midday. Designing an experiment studying 7 megahertz propagation from Rochester, Minnesota to Kansas City, Kansas, using the recording robot of the reverse beacon network with three significant digits by an SCR. So please welcome Mel Arkin. Let me introduce uh, my cohort here. Uh, this is Pat. Introduce yourself. Good evening, all. I'm Pat Keel. Uh, my qualified studies are OBM. Um, I'm a uh, senior member and I've been part of my group for 27 years, just not a lot of this group. Um, you know, I can't, I don't have the tenure that Del does, but I've been at this probably not very so um, we'll give you a good shot of uh, the intro of this SCR and get your questions ready. We'll do what we the answer. If not, we'll also get back to you. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you very much for coming. I, I see. Uh, Recognize some people in the crowd, uh, so this would be a cheering section that I work good. I also should tell you that I've got my speech coach with me here, my wife Carol, and uh, she says you really ought to have an introduction, three main points, and a summary. And it'd be nice if you could work in some jokes as you go along. <laughs> so. And you might see some arm and hand signals. If she's going like this, she says, too much detail, get on with it. <laughs> and if you see one of these, cut it off, it's over with. <laughs> uh, so, if you can't tell, this is the introduction part. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm uh, thinking that there might be some people in the room that are logic designers, this is IEEE logic designers, but they haven't worked with radio. And so there could be some radio terms that you wouldn't understand. So I want to do a little bit of, uh, that's why the, the second line there, historical analog components and functions, I want to make sure you understand what's going on in a radio a little bit. Uh, and then I'm going to move on to the digital components and functions that we use in software to find radios. So uh, we can see how those same functions are accomplished digitally rather than in the analog components, inductors and capacitors. Uh, maybe the highlight of the whole thing is this demonstration. I have a little RTL here that I actually bought from Pat. $25. Little $25 was made in, in uh, Europe for those people who wanted to listen to uh, television audio. And so just with this little $25, you could plug it into a laptop computer and, and hear the, the audio. And then some smart guys hacked into it and made it into this thing. That's so that's, that's what's going on there. And then uh, I want to have some examples of where the SCR being used is really superior to what the old analog radios were. And I've got some examples of that. And as I thought about this, really I had this uh, demonstration and I thought, you know, I understand the demonstration and operating and everything, but, but 
this lead in stuff is kind of boring. How about we just start right with the demonstration, okay? Pat says, don't do it. These guys are engineers. They want to understand how this thing works under the hood. Right? Don't, don't cut them short. So I was trying to think of a compromise position that I could do with that. And uh, I thought, you know, I'll raise the hood. I'll uh, take the cover off the air cleaner so you can see down in the carburetor where the needle valve is, but I won't tell you how to do the lean roll to get a nice even thing. I won't go into that kind of detail. <laughs> and uh, as I thought about that, you know, that sounds like old school because it's got fuel injection. There's no needle valves in the carburetor. And if you think about fuel injection, next slide. If you think about fuel injection, these fuel injectors are controlled by microcontrollers. They're controlled randomly. And the sensors are hooked up to uh, A to D converters, so you've got digital input into that. There's all the software that's going to do the, the functions. And then on the commands on the output side, you've got stepper motors that are adjusting. So if you think about that, it, it achieves improved performance on miles per gallon over what we used to get with carburetors. Uh, we've got much better emission controls and we've got cruise control. All that stuff. And it has provision for field upgrade of the program and functions. In, in cars, they call it a recall. On my cell phone, they say if you leave it powered up, and an internet connection will upgrade your software. Well, this is a microcosm of what's going on in software and fine grade, the same stuff. And the beautiful part is we can do this because the electrical engineers invented all these components that will work together in the system. So it's really great. All right, let's go to the next one. Uh, historical had like bandpass filters, you might be familiar with those. But also there's this business about mixers. Mixers might not be familiar with science. So let me uh, explain what mixers do. Oh, why well, did you play that? <laughs> Maybe, uh, maybe that isn't the word. Okay, well, we'll, we'll take them in order and, and we'll adjust the word. Right? Okay. There, there should be a, a screen that talks about the math of mixing. It's not there. Huh? I am not seeing it. Huh. Well, all right, let's get on with uh, Maybe it'll show up. Well, you, you, you first want to detect this. Okay, we'll work on detectors first. Uh, this is the transmit side. The top figure shows the base band audio. So you might have audio that's uh, 50 hertz to 3,000 hertz or something like that. Transmit that over the radio. So the second uh, figure there is a carrier. Uh, it happens to be out on one, one of my radio hooks, so it's at 3,500 uh, kilohertz, 3.5 kilohertz. And that's going to be the carrier frequency. And on the third one, after you put it in this modulator, the middle, the middle one shows it in, in real scale, but it expanded it. There's a thing called a lower side band and an upper side band, as well as that carrier. That's historically the way AM transmitters work. There's a misnomer there. We really don't need the carrier, but in the original, 
methods of doing things. There was a carrier, an upper, and a lower side there. Okay, next. Here's a simple receiver that just had an antenna, a detector, and a headphone. Probably what Marconi used to get across the ocean. He had a pretty simple stuff. He did all his tuning by the length of the antenna. He did the next thing. He did the so, just a detector, and that would respond to amplitude modulation. Next. Here's a little diagram of how it would work. The whole thing on the left is a modulated signal. After the diode, you pick off one side. There's only a single polarity, and then with a smoothing filter at the back there, you only get the envelope. And that's the audio that you hear in the headphone. AM detector, the simplest one we do. Next. Ah, next. This is the unique device and, and will show up over and over again in, uh, in the equipment. Early devices were multi grid electron tubes. Uh, more recently, we're using solid state diodes. But the effect is to mix an RF signal with a local oscillator, and it produces some different signal. And we use the one called the IF frequency. For instance, a local transmitter here in town, KRLC on 1340, is mixed with 1795. It's the sum 3135 that isn't of any use to us at all. But the difference is 455. Filters, and that's the IF. It's a band pass filter that picks up the 455 that selects which ones we want. Next. Some other examples would be in the FM broadcast. We show you KZ SE at 917. You run that local oscillator. At 22.4, you get the 194 one, which we don't care about, but a different 10.7 uh, megahertz is the IF, and that's accomplished, selected off of the band test filter called an IF transmitter. I've got some schematic diagrams so you can really get into this. Okay? Uh, a third one is uh, on my 10 gigahertz microwave transfer that operates at 10,368 megahertz. It uses a local oscillator chain of 10 to 24 plus the 144 megahertz two meter all mode range as the IF. This is a transmitter now instead of a receiver. And if the IF rig is single sideband, It'll transmit 10 gigahertz signal type. If I use the IF rig at CW, it'll transmit CW. If I use uh, FM in emergency, I, once in a while you got to use it, uh, it'll transmit FM. It looks really slick on this picture. Okay. Uh, I was going to do block diagrams of how these functions are laid out in a, and I thought it's easier just to go to my old RCA2 manual and pick out a schematic and, and show it. Uh, let me show you where the, where the components are here. Here we go. This first tube is the mixer tube. And it actually is two things in one. The local oscillator is a couple of elements in there that are tuned by these capacitor, variable capacitor, and uh, local oscillator transformer. Runs up here into the high uh, electron stream. There's a signal coming in from the antenna that's mixed with it. And here's the selective transformer for 400. I keep my hand off here. Right? Crazy. Uh, the 455 IF, there's an IF amplifier, another IF transformer, and right over here is the diode mixer. And the third tube 
there's a bag of mixture in it. So that thing will do AM. That's the AM detector there. Now, there's, a, there's an interesting circuit in there that uh, takes off the level of how strong these signals are, and there's a negative feedback system in there, and Carol's saying, Come on, don't get into that stuff. Don't go down that rabbit hole, okay? <laughs> You know, if if, uh, if the signal is in the correct quadrant of the phase plane, the thing will go into oscillation. We don't want that. Okay, next one. Here's the uh, FM receiver layout. Same thing on the left. Uh, we got an oscillator down below. That's a mixer. 10.7 uh, IF transformers up above do the coupling to uh, IF amplifiers, and then we run in way over on the right hand side the whole diode FM detector. The whole problem with this kind of a thing is on the FM, it'll only respond to FM. You can't throw a switch and do AM. The whole radio is laid out, one of them to do FM, the other one's all laid out to do. A. Go ahead. More recently, we've got the double balance mixer. quite well. In all your double E magazines, there's a thing called mini circuits where for $5 you can buy these things. They work great. And when we go to radio conferences at the prize table afterwards, those $5 items probably the last thing left on the table. Big antennas are taken. So I got lots of them at home in the bank. Okay, next. Oops. Do you miss one? No, nope, I skipped it. Sorry. Okay. But by 1985, the military was saying, you know, we got all these radios. We got some for HF, we got some for VHF, we got some for UHF, and they won't talk to each other. And if we decide we want to do radio teletech, we've got to get another radio. And what about if we want to do encryption? We'd have to have another radio again. You really ought to come up with something where you had more flexibility in one radio to do all these things at once. And the answer is software-defined radios. Uh, by the early 90s, the first SDR prototypes were coming out of this backroom stuff. We call it advanced technology. Uh, this is, I found in Wikipedia, a little bit of a layout. If you go to the next one, it's a little bit bigger on the screen. What we're showing here you got the antenna. Sorry. Did I show on the screen? No, no. Okay. The antenna. Uh, in, in a simple one like this $25 one, we have to do some uh, special operations before we get to the A to D. But finally, you get to the A to D uh, converter, analog to digital, and run them in to another section that's going to pick off something we call the I and the Q function. I'll do a little more detail on that later. And uh, the rest of it's all done in. Uh, laptop, computer, or whatever, we do digital signal processing instead of doing that analog stuff. So that's the general outline of this thing. That is uh, a more expensive FCR than I do, which means he paid six grand for his, okay? Well, what's the difference between a six grand one and a $25 one? The difference is my A to D converter is only eight bits. His is how many? 12 bits by 250 megahertz. It runs at 250 megahertz. Mine only runs at uh, two megahertz. So if I'm going to cover a lot of frequencies, I got to get that two megahertz selected out of there. So guess what? I use mixers. <laughs> Okay, go ahead. This thing wasn't even right. Let's go to the next one. 
He didn't even know how to do the squared function. Uh, this is the high level diagram of how we get this I and Q. If you go to another one, here's, uh, here's what happens. You come in with the RF, the, the X is the mixer symbol. Okay? A local oscillator works against that one, and a low pass filter picks out the imaginary part. By having a 90 degree phase shift on that local oscillator, we get the Q which is in quadrature to that I signal. You got one in quadrature with the other. And this whole thing, if you want to look this up and study it, is quadrature modulation and quadrature detection. I'll, I'll, I think I've got a place where I show you a little bit more about that. Go ahead. I did a uh, search on you see in the middle of the three words, quadrature, amplitude, modulation. Of course, the first thing that came up was what? How to buy a circuit board for $150, it'll do it. Okay, it's inside. So I kept going and came to this thing all about circuits. Now, here you go. Boy, if you study this, it'll tell you indeed how it works. But I'm not going to go down that road. Okay? If you want to know, I think you can study this thing on the internet to your heart's content. Okay? Next. Now I'm moving on to, we're going to do the demo. And I want to show you what, uh, what's inside the RTL SDR. Uh, next to the Next to the antenna connector over here. There's, there's two multi pin integrated circuits on the circuit board. That one is the front end part. That's the one that's got a local oscillator that'll mix down to the two megahertz bandwidth that we can handle. So there's one that'll do that kind of selection. And the other one is the one that does the A to D conversion and sends it out the, uh, to the USB port. And all the rest of the stuff is done in software in the PC. So that's the general layout of this $25. Next. Uh, and here's about the hacking that they did. Item number eight says they, an experimental direct sampling circuit was diplexed. Anyway, that'll get us down to 500 kilohertz up to 24 megahertz on this thing if, if you set it up right. And so that says we can, we, originally the thing was made for uh, VHF, it was gonna be 50 megahertz and up. That's the hack that they put on. Okay, next. This is a sneak peek of the software defined radio demonstration screen. And the fun part here is that in the thing, it shows that it'll do eight different kinds of operation on the same piece of hardware because they got the software in there that'll accomplish those equations that you need. So we can do narrow band FM, uh, that's like the police calls. The weather transmitter, that stuff is narrow band FM. The one below it is wide band FM. That's the high fidelity stuff from 88 to 108 that you're used to listening to the music. AM, KROC, and double side band is a thing uh, that they use if you're having trouble with the AM carrier. That, that'll actually decode the AM also. Lower side band, upper side band, CW, and raw. Raw means they're just going to take the I and Q and bring it out, and you can mail that over the internet to a headquarters someplace, and they can put whatever they want on it. And there's an, a thing going on here called a ham side, where they're a combination of ham radio operators and scientific people at the universities 
that want that kind of data from around the country to be able to study propagation. Okay, let's see what's next. Now, I'm going to try and do three demonstrations here. I got three different things that we're going to try and do. The first one is easy. That is, uh, the 91.7 has got a big signal. They run at least 100,000 watts out there on uh, Silver Creek. Nice high tower, really gets out well. I am hoping that that's going to get through the walls here of the auditorium and I should be able to pick it up and show that, okay? The medium one, uh, the second one, the harder, 1340, I'm not sure if these walls are, but I, I think it's going to work, okay? The last one is that there's a real interesting thing going on about studying propagation where the National Bureau of Standards on WWB on 10 megahertz out of Fort Collins, Colorado, 686 miles away, they got this special propagation test pattern that they transmit eight minutes after the hour. Has anybody in the room heard that? Ooh, this is going to be an eye opener, right? They're transmitting for like 30 seconds, once an hour, a special test pattern that I want to show you. And this $25 receiver will pick it up and display it like they want it. It's just amazing. Okay, let's go. Uh, this is a word diagram of, of what that special test pattern looks like. The interesting thing is that they have phase coherent sine waves that they're going to transmit at 2 kilohertz, 3, 4, and 5. They're going to have AM tones and they're going to drop that by 3 dB every second for 9 seconds. And what I got to figure out is how many of those can I hear? Can I hear the strongest one? And I'll show you a recording that I got where I could hear the four loudest ones and after that it was gone. So that's the kind of stuff that they want reported, okay? And they've also got another thing that they call a chirp. I call it a sweep, but anyway. The, uh, they have this sweep that goes out five kilohertz wide and comes back. Five kilohertz wide and comes back. And on that thing, I've also got, got it recorded and you'll see that uh, for some reason, when they were going out, it was fairly strong and when it was coming back, it was different than that. But I've got that thing recorded and I can play it four times over, whatever, so that we can really understand what's going on there and see it. So I don't have to depend on getting the signal from Fort Collins. I've got it uh, recorded ahead. I got it on my cell phone and Pat was smart enough to know how to put it on the laptop so we don't have to use the IP for to see that little screen. So thank you, Pat. Okay, next. Well, I, I, I would like to make an assertion, and we're going to show this thing again. The magic is the functions provided by the digital signal processing that we can do all these different things. The beauty is in the appearance shown in the graphical user interface and spectral display that I'm going to show. And the flexibility comes from the fact that any of the above can be changed, SMOP, simply a matter of programming. Okay? Okay, let's go on, Pat. That comes later. It's time to go to the... Stuff isn't somehow in the sequence, I was saying. It's time to do the demo. KROC here in town, and they're about that direction from us. If I turn this thing, you probably. Well, at least it's coming at. 1270 is KWEB, right? If 
I go up to 1340. This is kind of a clever uh, interface that they've got. If you just click on the bottom half of the number, it goes down. If you click on the top half of the number, it goes up by one. That's pretty handy, isn't it? 1340. Pat says when that happens, you turn the mouse off and you turn it on again and it resets itself. Isn't that amazing? I'm always just one click away from having a bit. 1340. One of the things we can do here is if you grab a hold of the right hand side, It'll close down the bandwidth. Cut all the highs off, right? Well, it ought to be more than two kilohertz wide, so. So, that's uh, AM. You notice uh, it's over here, it's saying double sideband. So I happen to be running double sideband on the detector. We've got a spectrum diagram up here that shows the amplitude vertically, frequency horizontal. And then there's this fun thing down here, this waterfall diagram that uh, will become important later on. So it's a time dropping down, okay? You see what the history of the signal has been. And I found a special little thing called a plug-in over here that it's injecting the date and time so that that gets recorded also. So this is really pretty slick. Any questions about this one? Yeah. Just wondering what, what's that to that frequency and to the uh, That's a peak there? Sorry, we weren't able to hear you. <laughs> just, just wondering, what is that? What is that? Oh, to peak? Yeah. Just so wondering, what, what is uh, what is that? The peak around? Oh, that. Yeah, that uh, that peak around. These two peaks up here, or this one over here? Yeah, that one over there. So that's probably some FM bleeding through because I've only got the eight bit. So you think that's some kind of noise there? Uh. I'm not sure that there really is a signal over there. Yeah. It's about okay. okay, look it. Here's what we do. I'm, I'm very interested in your questions. If I move the thing over, I'm right on it and nothing comes out of the detector. So I think it was a false signal of some sort. There, there could be some aliasing going on in the decoding as it's going through. So it picks up the, the it's a what they would call a spurious response. <clears throat> uh, I, I should have explained this, the, the heavy color <coughs> on the carrier the, the intensity of the color, just like on radar, the intensity of the color indicates the strength of the signal, right? So the, the, the carrier itself is strongest and that's why it's that, that thing by itself. So I think the other thing to point out is this is a log scale. And so I think that that spur was down about 30 dB. So, you know, compared to the carrier, it's down quite a ways. So let me go back to 1340. There's another thing I want to show you. What happened to our sound? I turned it off because we were trying to hear the question. Oh. So go down and click on the speaker. And then click on the other end of it, the other end, where the X is. Okay, one other thing that I wanted to show you is 
if I put my cursor within the area, it's showing the most important thing is that the bottom number, SNR, signal to noise ratio, look at that, to three significant digits. Way better than what the ham radio used to have where you went from S0 to S9, one digit, right? So much more precise. I'm looking for another adapter because that number keeps jumping around. I want to do some uh, weighted averaging to slow it down uh, so I can get a number that I got time enough to write it down or whatever. But I'll, I'll, I'll get to that. Uh, what else can we show here? Uh, there was a second question that I didn't get to. Somebody else asked a question. Same question. Yeah. Same answer. <laughs> okay. It's gotten awful quiet in here. Um, I, I have a story about a guy that, that uh, was really keenly interested in, in uh, detection and, and that sort of thing. He was driving through town and uh, he went through there uh, 29 miles an hour and all of a sudden there was this flash. This is in Iowa. There was a flash and he thought, gee, I'm under the speed limit. Well, what's, what's that thing doing? So he drove around the block and went through again five miles slower. Got up to it, flash. He kept this up for five and couldn't figure out how they could be off that far on the calibration on speed. A week and a half later comes a letter in the mail, five tickets <laughs> for not having a seat belt on. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's, let's try. Yeah. Now we're gonna, I'm gonna move it from the AM. If we're done with AM, I wanna move to FM and show you what that one looks like. Okay. I gotta change the, I gotta change the operation so you don't do a stop. I go to settings. And I change this thing from direct sampling to quadrature Q branch. Let's see, quadrature sampling. Is that oh, the right one? Yep, you're on it. I want quadrature. And I need to increase the bandwidth a little bit to 2.4 megabits per second. Let's see if that works. Close that, start it again. Probably no one here any Oh, we gotta change the antenna. And the frequency. You go up to uh, 91.7. But I'm gonna take this antenna off the AM antenna. That was self-resonant in the AM band. And put it on. Sudan, now known as the city where thousands are stranded awaiting evacuation by sea. It's beautiful, it has, you know, it's the Red Sea. Okay, now you may be able to see that we changed from AM to wideband FM. And finally, and, uh, here, it's important to get them talking about how they feel about the war. Here we got a much stronger signal probably, let me set it on there, does it show? Getting back to the routine is key to relieving anxiety and worry. So, for us so that says that thing is coming in at 37 uh, dB signal to noise, much stronger signal, okay? This is this 100,000 one out on Silver Creek. And again, there's some spurious signals. I think all of these things over here, you notice it comes and goes as she talks. Something else is causing those. There really isn't signals there. Just the radio is showing, but you notice the, uh, the the waterfall down here on the weaker signals is much lighter, right? But sometimes a weak signal on the waterfall is exactly what you're looking for. I'll come to that later. 
Okay, so this is, well, what's these things here? You notice there's a square one and a square one alongside. This is the analog FM audio. These are the digital uh, subcarriers that is doing the music in digital mode and doing a talk show in uh, digital mode. So if you got the right kind of receiver, well, you can pick off that digital stuff. And if I drop down to 90.7, that's the music station. I can hardly hear it. Have I got it set right? Yep. Well, oh, let's try this. There's a preamplifier in that first chip. So if I stop the thing, go to settings, and increase the gain of the preamplifier, maybe we'll be able to hear it. No, let's drop down to this one. This one looks a lot louder. I think that's the, the Right. How about the country station on? Uh, President Vladimir Putin is, of course, hoping his nation's border. That's the one we were listening to, 91 so. Break on power will be strengthened. Many outside Russia. This is the old uh, KNXR. They've got some different programming now. 97.5 is on that same tower. Here's one that isn't quite as loud. You notice it's 32 dB out of the noise. This one is uh, 28. Okay, any questions about the FM mode and detector? Yes. Quick question. Do you know the uh, sampling rate of this? Uh, the sampling rate. Yeah. How many how many samples per second the uh, sample is? My sampling rate is about uh, four thousand per second. Okay. Okay. And so with that, I can decode half of that according to somebody's theorem, right? If we assume it's a sinusoid and I get two samples, I can rule out half the sample rate. Okay. It's, I said 2,000, it's, it's uh, two mega samples per second. It's four mega, four mega samples per second, I can resolve two megahertz per second. Okay. Sure. Any other questions on that? Okay. Let me go to shut this one down. The third one that I wanted to do was this scientific study of propagation from WWV. Uh, now, Pat, you want to minimize this one. Go ahead. I'm going to go online and, and show them. Uh, Did you have it up here? No. Uh, first, we're going to. This one? Yeah. Okay. So, don't you want to buy an ad blocker? No, I don't want to get it around.
Let me just raise this up a little bit there. Right, right at the minute they're showing, before I start the video, they're showing this is the two kilohertz, three kilohertz, four kilohertz, and five kilohertz tones that they're going to transmit. And they're going to do it, uh, they're just putting in AM and it generates both the upper and the lower sideband, okay? And the carrier is this big heavy stream in the middle and, and the, these are the tick marks, one per second, okay? And then afterwards, the sweeps are going to occur, and this just happens to be some white noise. Some guys really get excited about white noise, but uh, anyway. So let me play this. Uh. At the tone, 22 hours, 8 minutes, coordinated universal time. Can we turn it up? So that's this test signal at WWV. You saw the two, three, four, and five kilohertz tones that are stepping down three dB each one per second, and then that sweep that went out and came back. The, the recording that I found here on the internet is by the ham side people, and what they did, this is a transmitter at two and a half megahertz in Fort Collins, Colorado, and there's a ham radio operator that lives in downtown Fort Collins, Colorado, about eight miles away. So he's so close to this 10 kilowatt transmitter that he really gets a good signal. And I think those signals that you see off to the side are a problem with his radio. I really don't believe that WWV has got harmonics by overdriving it like some guys do on the Citizens Band, all right? So I think that's what's going on. The recording that I have doesn't show those additional frequencies at all. But I'm 600 miles away. OK, let me, let me play that again. I want you to see the, the waterfall of the tones that step down 3 dB at a time, and then the sweep that goes out and the sweep that comes back. So let's try that again, ham side. How did you find out about it? Well, I heard it on a radio. Scientific modulation test. For more information, 
Visit hamsci.org slash WWB. Okay, we see you another half times. If you just heard that on the radio, you wouldn't understand what they're doing. But if you got the right kind of a display, it kind of makes sense what, what they're trying to show, okay? At least I think so. All right, let me uh, cut this off. Now I want to go to, I knew I wouldn't be able to pick it up at 600 miles away here in the room, so I've got a recording. Let me see if I can find that.
about, about that thing before I go on to the brag. No? All right. Pat, bring me back to the, the PowerPoint. If I can, uh, if I can interrupt real quick. Yes. Uh, circling back. So besides um, sort of having this cool test pattern that people can use to see if they're if they can pick it up or not, are there any other distinct use cases for that test pattern? Do people use it for calibrations or verifying uh, the quality of an antenna or anything like that? Sure. All of the above and more. First of all, people use the carrier frequency itself to address their uh, test equipment. So if you're going to try and get a frequency counter right on, you zero beat on the 10 megahertz, and it is 10 megahertz. There's no arguing with those guys. They are right on. Okay, traceable to the National Bureau of Standards. That, that's, that's the main reason for that thing. Uh, also the time, you can set your clock by it. So that was historically the reason for it. But this ham side, this special test pattern, is so they can do some studies about what happens normally and fading and, and some of those things. So, so that's a new thing now. Did I answer your question? Yes. Okay. Thank you. And I think if you want more detail, if you go to if you go to that hamsci.org, they'll give you a more detailed uh, specification of what they're trying to do. Mm -hmm. They're looking at the way propagation works over time and also over solar radiation. So they're trying to characterize the ionosphere. Very cool. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, now I'm going to show uh, a couple of places where the digital signal processing techniques really helped. And uh, one of these is my uh, 10 gigahertz operation and some work that we did with that. So this is what the transverter and transceiver look like. The obvious thing is the dish. The dish is off of somebody's roof. It was for... Uh, uh, television at 11 gigahertz. We bored out the uh, feed horn so it would work at 10 uh, 368. Uh, the horn is, is closer to me that uh, does this offset feed. Next. That's the transfer inside the box is the mixer that takes the 144 megahertz, beats it with a local oscillator and comes out 10 368. 3 watts output 32 dB a gain on that antenna. 10 dB gain would be a factor of 10. 20 dB gain is a factor of 100. 30 dB gain is a factor of 1,000. So my three watts right out front is like three kilowatt. Don't stand there and look at it. It'll boil the stuff in your eyes. Bad deal. Okay, next. That's the IF rig. Uh, 20 years old or so, but that thing can do sideband, CW, FM. It'll do all those modes, and whatever I put into the transfer, it comes out uh, in that mode. Okay? So, Carol and I were doing a radio operation last January. And in the upper right-hand corner, you can see on the thermometer, here we're up in uh, Minneapolis, and uh, it's showing that uh, it's what? 18 degrees out, right? And I'm set up facing east over in this direction. I happen to know that that's the, my buddies over in uh, Eau Claire, Wisconsin. And so I can work them on lots of bands over in Eau Claire. Now we'll go to the next one. Now here, in my estimation, is a real thing of beauty. <laughs> <laughs> this is the way you ought to outfit your truck, right? Some of the guys from IBM used to see this thing in the parking lot, I think. <laughs> anyway, I've been at this for quite a while. Uh, so this is uh, three miles east of St. Charles on the frontage road, just on the south side of I-90. 
I'm right by an overpass that's going to go over there. And on the right hand side, that's uh, 30 degrees. That's where I can get to the people in Eau Claire, Wisconsin. On the left, K0AWU is up in uh, Grand Rapids, Minnesota, north of Duluth. And with those uh, antennas, I can work them on like four bands. Uh, I haven't worked them uh, from here on 10 gigahertz, but uh, the lower bands works just fine. One of the real features of this, there's these Yagi antennas. Can't get the monster show up. The Yagis are, are the long boom ones. And uh, you understand the, the, the history of Yagi antennas in 1937, there was uh, two guys in Japan working on uh, multi-element antennas. A guy by the name of Yagi and a guy by the name of Uda. Uda did all the work. Yagi went to the conferences, <laughs> wrote the papers, and so we call it a Yagi antenna. Right? Uh, okay, next one. Here's the 10 gigahertz now I'm set up. I want to talk to this guy in North St. Paul. It's, it's uh, 18 degrees out on uh, the 14th of January. It's pretty cold. There's wind chill coming from my left. Uh, you try and, try and put the headphones over the ear flaps and it's, it's really hard to hear. But anyway, uh, the normal protocol is the guy with the biggest signal will beacon and uh, the other guy tries to find it. Uh, he's got eight watts, I've only got three. He beacons to me, I don't hear a thing. But I've got a talk back on the cell phone and I say, uh, okay, let's try swish a dish. I'm going to move my dish around. You watch your screen and tell me if you ever see anything. And he and so I, 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 I've got some squint in my system. I've got a very precise compass in my cell phone. I know exactly where to point the thing according to the compass, but I don't hear him. So I do the swish addition a little bit to the right. He says, oh, there's a little bit more. Oh, you went past it, back up. Then we get S7 when we both get lined up on each other. S7 signals, easy on signals, single sideband, all right? So it really worked great. Just because he had that waterfall diagram on his, he could find me in, the, in a weak signal thing at 100 miles away. I let Carol stay in the truck. It's nice and warm in there, right? But we turned on her automatic voice keyer. W0GHC, this is n 0 I. QSL, you're EN 34, over. He comes back and says, okay, Carol, I, I got the information. You sound a little distorted. <laughs> she comes back, Roger, Roger, QSL 73. So that one worked pretty good. Yep. That one worked, okay, next. Uh, this is uh, over by Dodge Center in uh, September. I'm uh, trying to work a guy, this is uh, to K0AWU up at Grand Rapids, 230 miles away on uh, 10 gigahertz. It turns out, if you click one more, Pat, that tree is only like uh, 300 yards away or so, 400 yards away, and the azimuth to Grand Rapids happens to be right through that tree. I can hear a little bit, but really not enough to call it a call. So I know that there's a place three miles further east that ought to work better because I've used it before. I get there and what is it? Nine foot corn. <laughs> this isn't going to work good at all. Next. But in the truck, I got it up high in the back end of the truck, right? What's the view from in the truck? I can see over the corn. So we start working with, with Bill. Same thing. Can't hear a thing. I start to swish a dish, turn the thing a little bit. He says, I still don't see it. Oop, there's something. Well, it went away. It must have been an airplane. Keep going. So I turn a little bit more to the right. And on this one, the signal did not get very loud. But we did a three by three. I sent all my information three times. 
And that took me about a minute to send it, and there's some fading. So he can piece it together. You've heard part of it on one of them, you heard part of it on another one. The most beautiful thing I hear when I let up, I'm getting Rogers from him. He heard my information, right? So we did that one. Uh, I think that's it for there, Pat. Uh, while we take some Q&A, uh, I, I, uh, if you want to send me an email because you want to know a link to anything, why, I, I'm good for that. Pat uh, also. Uh, back up, can you back it up? Yep. Are there any questions? Yeah. I gotta be just a little tiny bit of a contrarian. And that's your your whole SDR radio premise? Yeah. How does an SDR radio retune that antenna for 11 gigahertz? The antenna, not the radio. Yeah. I mean, I, I will contend as a contrarian that if you get a 10, if you got a perfectly resonant antenna inside all these walls on WWV, and you put a very narrow band filter in front of it, an analog filter, so all the other noise from all the radios in Rochester didn't come through, and you put enough gain on it, you have a good chance of hearing WWV. And you can't retune that with software. That's what I really don't understand about these SDRs in a military environment. They live in a very, potentially a very RF noisy environment. How do you keep the overload from killing the frequency of interest? Yeah. I, I, I can't directly answer that question, but there's a piece missing here, Pat, that, that yeah. I, wanted, I wanted to bring up. Have you got an answer, Pat? I do. I do. So <clears throat> part of this, and it's a, it's a little counterintuitive, but if you put a voltmeter on an antenna, and I don't care where you do it, inside or outside, um, you're going to have the entire spectrum. But it's still within the A to D converter's capabilities. So for instance, not with the $25 one, but if you're using the direct sampling, where you're taking RF samples off the antenna, and you've got a 16-bit A to D converter that's going down from, and if you look, if you put a voltmeter on it, you might, you might, if you're next to a big radio station, get a volt out of it. And a lot of AT, A to D converters can take that and digitize it. The magic comes in when you've got the uh, I and the Q, which is kind of like, now you have the real and the imaginary part. And now you can do all the work with your fast forward transforms to be able to pull that out. Now your question on the 10 gigahertz, the 11 gigahertz, what Mel said was, they drilled out the feed horn to make it a little bit bigger. So they tuned the antenna. It had nothing to do with the SCR. But the point is, if you had an SCR, and you wanted military frequency agility, and you wanted to run from 9 to 11 gigahertz, how would you do that? Because you can now take that entire frick, that, that entire spectrum going from, say, what, what the radio I'm using now will go from 0 or 50 kilohertz to 70 megahertz continuous. And so the, the frequency agility, there's no tuning or anything, it's just changing where the software is tapping into that signal. So it's digitizing the entire spectrum and can then be able through the uh, through the work of uh, all of the mathematical transforms be able to zero in on all of those frequencies. The key here is how finely can you sample that and then how fast can you operate on it? When you start looking at these things, they end up with some really high-end FPGAs, which is why it's not a $25 unit, it's a $6,000 unit. So they're literally taking that 250 mega sample per second at 16 bits, and then going in and doing high-level, uh, if you will, windowing to show those different pieces. But the same A to D is still just Pushing out the data, it's the way it's operated on and presented. Uh, you mentioned overload earlier. Well, how about that? that there signal? is no overload because, again, because if you're looking at that signal on the antenna, it never gets above a volt. 
It's counterintuitive, but it's true. So everything is inside that waveform, if you will. Now your challenge is to get it out, and that's where the SDR shines, is it's able to do the mathematics to either take out a wide signal like what Mel was showing, or you can take out and just look a very narrow filter. And all the analog things, they would have the skirts that would fall off, you would have the challenges, you know, like a 3, 3 dB per octave fall off uh, for your filters. And if you got steeper by using crystal filters, you'd start ringing. Well, now if you trend, that's because you're in an analog domain. If you move into the digital domain, you can get these almost straight sides. Brick wall filters are gone. Yep. So, you know, I ran into that problem too. How can I get this signal that's way like this? I'm hearing this little thing without the overload. And I was thinking about it wrong because I was thinking that, like, that the A to D was going to be overloaded. But if you go in and put a wide band oscilloscope on that antenna, you never get that high voltage. So it's all within that range. Is that making sense? Yes, actually. It, okay, it, I got two items go. Go ahead. So let's say you go spend a hundred or two hundred dollars on one of these SDR receivers. Yes. What kind of antenna do you want? What, what do you the want? The best antenna you, you can buy. Outside. But is that a directional antenna? Is that so it, it depends on what you it, again, it's purpose built. Do you want a, a simple antenna that would be omnidirectional and then you would hear everything, but then you would not have any gain in a specific direction. So like I have a 20 and 40 meter dipole in right. my attic. Yeah. So, so just as with the old radios, the better antenna gave you a better experience, that would be the same in the SDR world. Okay. Because uh, what we're doing is we're talking about what happens after the antenna, not what's going on from uh, up to the antenna. So again, if we've got a better signal coming in, the SDR is just another way to do it that the analog way can do. So when you start talking antennas, whatever worked in the analog world works just as well in the SDR. All right, time for one more. I just had a question about uh, the hardware and the software. Does it come as a kit? Do you have to buy the software with it, or are they separate? Or open? It's open source. It's open source. Okay. And the hardware is, in essence, open source. Uh, it, most of these things are coming out of China from something that was designed in Germany. Okay. So um, you, whether you call it completely hardware open source, in, in essence, is. So. And again, there's a wide range, everything from the $25 one up to what the military is using nowadays, which makes what I've got look like a toy. I got two other items that I'll try and do quickly. Okay. Uh, one, you had a guy here uh, probably 20 years ago, Terry Van Den Scoten, the guy that bounced signals off the moon. Terry says, he was an early adopter of software-defined radios. He bought one uh, probably uh, $200 for three cards, not even have a case and all that. But his important thing was, he said, Mel, this is really going to change my receive signals off the moon because I can record this stuff digitally and keep it. And maybe later on, somebody will come up with a better filter and I'll be able to go back and listen to that old stuff with a new filter and I'll hear something that I never heard before. You know what the current application of that is? In February, there was this, I see the balloon, the balloon sees me thing, came across doing figure eights out in Montana. And, well, I won't go through the whole story, but finally they shot it down. And there was some discussion about, uh, well, why did you work so long, you know? You, you're, you're really slack. And the answer was, well, there was balloons during uh, Trump, and he didn't do anything about it. The real part of that story is, it's just recently that we came up with a filter that could see the balloon. 
they went back and looked at the Trump recordings, and now they can see that there was balloons during Trump. They didn't know it at the time until they came up with the new filters. Okay. And I would also add to that Terry's prediction about being able to hear things when new filters came out. That actually came true. So he had been recording a number of his things over time and keeping the, uh, at that time he was using basically a mixer that would go from RF to audio and then use a stereo card in a computer to get a 44 kilocycle sample. But now they've added new filters that were actually able to dig more things out of the, out of the noise. So the, the thing that has happened, I've got a seven year old radio, but it gets updated every year. And the, the number of things that they've added from the processing capabilities of it have been phenomenal. And they've got a white band notch filter that will go in and basically take something out no matter how wide the, the bandwidth you're looking at is. So. Well, thank you very much, Pat. Thank, thank you very much, Mel. i got one other thing. Let me see if it's here. There's a, a problem sometimes as guys get older, they get uh, kind of feisty and, and discouraged with how things are going and they start doing a lot of swearing and stuff. I'm, I'm trying not to do that. I'm trying to finish well. And uh, Philippians 4.8 says, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, things that are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any grace, think on these things. I'm trying to use that as a guide. Thank you very much. Thank you.